engaging critically you know, with the text. Um, many of these texts are available online. So they can download free versions of the Fairy Queen or Beowulf or whatever those texts are and then create a, a, a multi-edited version you know, in a wiki. And my students are coming away and saying they're learning more about these texts than they had ever learned before in a kind of a lecture uh, discussion based uh, kind of classroom. And again, it goes back to their really wanting to engage and be producers of these texts in some form or another. So I, it doesn't really bother me that the textbooks are going away. You know, students are finding other ways. They're, they're, they are curious and they are interested in learning and reading in all sorts of ways that previous generations uh, were not necessarily interested in reading. Well, Susan, he, he talked about, mentioned in that video that more students are going through me remedial training or have to go back to remedial classes uh, than they were 20 years ago. So I assume they're using the same test to judge that. Are we not sending more, are we, you know, um, those students also 20 years ago probably weren't, as he said, able to go back and use a Blackberry and use their laptop computers and, and search the internet. I mean, they didn't have that type of knowledge and those types of skills. So um, the, the, the digital nation, making the digital nation, are we not making more information uh, available to students and therefore we're sending more students to college? And isn't that a good thing? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, in, in thinking about um, the, the percentage of students who need remediation, I think, it, you know, certainly a part of that comes about because we are making a higher education available to a greater percentage of the total population than previously. You know, when I went to college, most, the majority of students it, that graduated in my high school graduating class did not go to college. I think that's very different now. Uh, and so I, certainly, uh, you know, we're seeing a greater percentage of the population go to college. So certainly there is that influence. But I think uh, in terms of students is to assume that, you know, there's some kind of dichotomy. We have to pick one of those when in fact, you know, content can be presented in a variety of forms and I, I would certainly hope that we don't set up that dichotomy of you know well if we have technology we don't have more traditional kinds of instruction the other thing that um, about this argument that I think is very interesting is um, I get I get very frustrated <laughs> full of frustration it sounds like <laughs> um, but I, I get very frustrated when I hear people say things like oh MIT put all of its courses online and they're free and, and I think, you know, <laughs> what they did was put their course content online, okay? Um, and you're not getting a teacher. So if they put their courses online and there's no teacher, do we need teachers? So, and on that note, what a great <laughs> note to... <laughs> we're we're going to play one more video, and, and then after to that the video, other it's table. your opportunities to, <laughs> to uh, come up and go up to one of the mics over there. Uh, and ask questions of the panel, either on this video that we're about to play or on any of the previous questions that they gave. What we're gaining uh, are two very important things. Uh, one is the ability for people to be in communities and collaborate and be smarter in the community than they are as an alone individual. This is something that kids, kids play games socially. We have found that people predict that this was going to be a socially isolating technology. Far from it. It's almost impossible to find a kid who doesn't want to play socially, who doesn't want to join groups, who doesn't want to be a fan on something and start building websites. So uh, we're, we're growing a bunch of people who see what they do as very social, and collaborative and as parts of joining communities and then they want to teach in those communities and they want to mentor in those communities and they want to lead and they want to build uh, as part of those communities and I think that's uh, it, 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 to the extent that these communities are good they're not all good but to the extent that they are good this is a very positive feature do it all on your own and uh, you get to be an expert in one narrow thing uh, that's dangerous now uh, we need you to be an expert we, but we need you to be able to be on a team with other experts. Uh, in business, they call these teams cross-functional teams. That is where everybody on the team is an absolute expert in something, but they know how to integrate their expertise with everybody else in the team. They know how to understand the other person's expertise so that they can pull off action together in a complicated world and in very complicated problems. Now, this is also what a hunting party is in World of Warcraft. 
World of Warcraft sells people cross-functional teams. Things that are high stress in the workplace, people go home and join one. Uh, you're in a hunting party of five people. Every person must be a different type of character and must have mastered the skills of that character perfectly. But you also better understand the skills of every other character so you can integrate with them. So we're seeing cross-functional teams in play. We're seeing them in workplaces. And uh, they're therefore a very important way of being in the world in the 21st century. Uh, because they give us the good of expertise, but they save us from some of the bad. That is the narrowness, uh, the privileging of your own knowledge against other people's. Uh, and kids are, uh, they're ready for this world. They're ready to be on these teams. It's not clear they're getting it in school. In fact, a lot of this is called cheating in school. Right? School is still just testing each individual, testing you on one day. Uh, and it's not seeing what you can do with smart tools. It's not seeing what you can do with other people. Uh, so we really have two school systems now. We have one out of school in which people are learning to collaborate. They're learning to use smart tools. They're learning to, they're learning to build and not just take it the way people give it to them. And then we have a, a school system which is based on the same old individual idea of trying to find out what's inside your head and see whether you're better than the person next to you. What they are allowing people to do, for good or ill, because any powerful technology can be used for good or ill, uh, they are allowing people to discover other aspects of their real selves. Right? You, 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 because you can play with your identity, you can play with your avatar, you can try out things in these spaces in a little bit safer way sometimes because the other person isn't right next to you, they can't hit you. Um, and, uh, and what are you discovering? You're not discovering something fictional about yourself, you're discovering something real about yourself. Okay, if we have any questions, again, feel free to go ahead and move to the microphones and ask, a, and ask uh, the question. I'm going to, while Larry moves up there, I'm going to ask Dan a quick question. I, I won't pick on Meg or, or make you go again, I'll pick on you. But, <laughs> but you, had made the comment, you had made the comment that uh, we're, we're, you know, our society is a sit-down society and the kids, you know, we're allowing kids to just sit there and, and not, um, not go out and play and act and do actions the way we are. Now he describes that basically kids are doing the exact same thing, they're just doing it in a different medium. And so Dan, uh, the question is, as we've talked several times about, you know, uh, testing, the way it was tested 20 years ago, the old classroom, are, are, are we thinking in the old classroom when we look at our kids and say, hey, you should be outside doing that instead of online doing that, but you're developing the same skill? Well, I think uh, I, I'm a big fan of what's going on in game technology, and I think there actually should be more kind of an interactive world, uh, really blending together textbooks and gaming technology in some kind of way, so there's a digital uh, collaborative activity that's going on. I'm not, um, you know, uh, uh, as far as physical activity, right, or getting out and doing things, I mean, uh, you know, uh, one could criticize somebody for sitting around and reading a book. Know, for two or four hours, and and uh, and, and uh, you know, rather than being online, it's really a matter of what book that person is reading and engaging in, and and uh, what kind of technology you know one is engaging in. Um, you know, if you're play playing a game like Civilization Four or something like that, where you're engaged in trying to think about the best way to create a culture or create your own world, and there are all sorts of learning possibilities within that game. I think that, that that offers some opportunities that maybe some of the other games you know do not offer. Um, but uh, you know the, the, the technology is there. We haven't really corralled it in a way that really helps to get students engaged critically. And I hear that over and over the, the need for more critical thinking and communication. But it's you know it's amazing to see what students will do once they get into those games and interacting with them, um, and even their discussion about what's going on inside those games. So um, I think. Uh, there's, there's more potential there than necessarily the Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
I think I heard you say <laughs> <laughs> But do you think it's important that that we do teach all these old skills because I mean if your stapler breaks you know you can just fold the corner of the paper over Ooh. and tear it twice and fold that back and it works just as well cool. I mean there are some skills that I'm not sure we need to continue teaching uh, I think as technology changes we need to embrace the new technology and not worry about falling back on how did you do a DOS file and and you know how did we do some of those old-time things like the typewriter and for those of you who are young a typewriter is about this big <laughs> and it has keys on it and you can type things and when you finish a line of type, you have to hit a bar that goes over. Well, Larry, I, I appreciate that because I thought you were going to say I had to pick up my chisel and move it to the next spot. <laughs> <laughs> I just missed that by a couple oh, yeah. years. <laughs> it, was that question for Mag or anyone up here? Anyone up here. Oh, there, there was another tool that came along with the typewriter. It was a ruler. You'd have to measure down below, right, if you were in a footnotes and things like that at the bottom of a page. I tell my students about that, and of course they don't really care, because they don't have to, <laughs> like, you know, I remind them of what, you know, because, and I was such a horrible type, you know, a typist, I was just this hunt and peck. And part of what was part of the process for typing, though, in those days, is that when I sat down to type my essay, I wanted to make certain it was in good shape, because I didn't want to retype that essay, you know. So there are some things about process and pulling material together that we have to transfer. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote many drafts of my, my draft before I typed it. I, I made certain I had enough time, you know, to get it done because I was such a, a, a slow type, typist um, and had that ruler, you know, uh, to get it all measured out. You know, there, there could be certain skills that we do need to transfer in terms of planning and, and, and measuring and things like that that we can take back into our classroom. And Susan, thinking, oh, you know, I mean, thinking is what you talked about. The fact that you had to think it through, what you wanted to do, so that there was a lot of reflection involved. And uh, when I say that, you know, kids sit in front of something for six hours, um, I have no problem with kids engaged in those collaboration tools. I play uh, Words with Friends with my brother in Dallas. It's a Scrabble game that I use on my iPod Touch, and I enjoy doing that. But I, uh, we, a game may go two or three days, you know, not just sitting there the entire time doing it. We must teach our students process. We much, must teach them how to think. But I do believe uh, I was one of the first to throw out my old typewriter because I could not stand typing. I've actually become a better typist since I've, you know, uh, I use the keyboards, but the backspace key should have my name on it. The delete mm -hmm. and backspace key were built for me. And so, uh, we, we need to be constantly looking at what's new and teaching that. In 10 years' time, we may, may not need a keyboard at all. But yes, we still need to be teaching some keyboard skills, but we need to be doing it in third and fourth grade and not in high school and college. Susan, did you have a response or go back? No, actually, I, I want to speak to the topic of communication skills based mm -hmm. on online. So that if someone wants to speak to the typewriter well, discussion. OK. Go ahead and take your question. That. Hello. Okay, this is this is kind of along the same lines of about you know when is it okay to stop teaching things. I'm a math teacher. Um, I get that question. When am I going to use algebra all the dang time? And I know the thing of well, you never know when your calculator is going to break down. I know that's a lame response. Okay, <clears throat> and I've thought and thought and thought why do you need to to learn algebra? And eventually, this is what I came up with, and this is what I tell my students. It's usually an athlete that asks the question. And so um, I will say, um, well, do you work out? Do you lift weights? And usually he will nod in the affirmative. And I say, so if you're doing a bench press, you're laying on your back and you're lifting the weights, 
how often in the real world are you going to lay on your back, pick up something heavy, and lift it up and down on your chest ten times? And he says, well, never. What's your point? <clears throat> and I say, so then why do you do it so much? And he says, well, because in the games, in football games or whatever, I need those muscles. And I say, that's exactly what math is. You're using muscles in your brain. You may not ever have to do some long division, divide 4,302 divided by 160. You may not ever use it in your life. I don't. But the fact that you can do it means you are using brain processes that you use in the rest of the world. Life is just a bunch of story problems. <laughs> and you have to be able to down. think through them. <laughs> so there's a balance between the mechanics of what you teach and then what you can use calculators for. But that's what I propose to my students. Okay. Uh, I just, there was an interesting contradiction uh, with our youth and young people that they, they're obese yet malnourished. And I'm wondering if our students aren't technologically obese and technologically malnourished. And that's what, you know, that's a problem that I see that, you know, they get all the junk food, if you will, but don't get the, the real food. And as far as the long division, I was a former high school math teacher. And uh, I just challenge you to, can you explain why long div division works? Why divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, work? You know, and, and to me, long division is one of those things. It's a calculator. And I, you know, but knowing, you know, your multiplication facts, I think, is important. And uh, one of the challenges often that's put out is, oh, we don't want to memorize anything. I read an article lately. Anything you know, you memorized. And, and you have to have those basic facts so that you even know how to Google it. You, know, you have no basic spelling to Google. So anyway, that's my comment. And I don't know if any of you can explain long division. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, Susan, maybe we'll have your, yeah, your yeah, comment yeah. on communication, and we'll leave yeah. you two to Actually, long division. you know, I can <laughs> explain, because when I took a math class in my teacher ed program, we developed a new numbering system on base 7, and we learned how to do all of those things, so I know why long division <laughs> works. Um, I, I did want to address this issue, however, of communication skills and the online world. I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing more and more problems with um, incivility, not just online, but in our classrooms. And this is a topic that is, has been raised over and over again for probably the past three to five years, is general incivility. I think it's, you know, I don't want to lay the blame entirely on, you know, people communicating online, but I also think it's very interesting that, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, um, there was a blurb written up in Inside Higher Education about a presentation that I had done at a conference, and I, it was very interesting that many of the uh, comments that followed that that were um, really rather startling in their, uh, this rather sweeping generalizations they made about my character um, and what I know uh, it came from people who uh, wrote them anonymously. And at that point I decided I am not going to participate in online discussions that are um, you know, professional and academic anonymously anymore. I think it's, it's too easy for us to forget that there's a person on the other end of that. I also think that we lack, not just in the online world, but we lack good models for how to interact in a constructive way when we disagree with someone. You know, I was going to start my presentation by saying that, you know, I, um, I'm not real familiar with debate and this sort of panel discussion, and so I watch television news to, to see some models for how we would behave. And, and basically, I wanted to say that anybody who disagrees with me is a Satan worshiping pedophile, possibly way <laughs> to raise my wolves. Um, I think that's fairly obvious to anyone who's not a pinhead. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I think, I think we lack those models for constructive disagreement. Um, and so those of you who do agree with me, you know, you, you know who you are and the rest of you 
get out. <laughs> so, so basically, we need to figure out whether you're Fox News or MSNBC. <laughs> I mean, I am not naming any letters, but I don't. As I said, I don't think it's a coincidence that this growth of the ability to communicate with people anonymously is going along with this rise of general incivility, even in a face-to-face -face environment. And I think that's something we really need to address in the, in the idea of communication and how technology influences the way we behave in society. Go back to the audience. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, one has to do with maybe what we're trying to do in terms of just the general human condition. Um, I wonder how we let our students know that there might be psychological and perhaps even great spiritual value in being left alone for a while and just being with one's own thoughts. <laughs> and that this may be a very enriching, very fulfilling experience. Not only that, I also am concerned that they are going to leave our classrooms where we seem to be very preoccupied with adapting to them, their brain learning styles, and all these other styles, send them out into a work world where the boss, who is paying them a very large sum of money and isn't really concerned about what their learning styles are, really wants them to get the job done. By the way, probably not too much, inter too much interference with texting and other things that aren't directly related to the work they're doing. So I'm wondering if we also are sending them out kind of um, undisciplined, mentally undisciplined for the very work world we say we're preparing them for. Um, and I say this based on the fact that only about a third of my career has been in the classroom. The others have been out. We're in the work world. I'd add one other comment. I think some long time ago, hiring a person with a college degree was considered hiring a uh, cross-functional team. Each person was a cross-functional team. So would know division and algebra. So one time, perhaps a little Greek and Latin, read the classics, had read great literature, could, uh, could perhaps discuss a little bit about philosophy and chemistry and a variety of other things. And I'm, well, I'd like for us to go back to that too. Well... And Dan, I think you had a comment before. It, 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 it addresses uh, you know, this concern and, and, and some of the other things that we're talking about. I think ultimately what we really want to, to ensure is that our students come away being problem solvers. And, and that's something that, that you know, we might worry about. You know, I was thinking about this whole division thing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ian Eskill's Play the Lesson. Um, and it's a professor and a female student. And uh, the student comes as his professor. and. She hasn't finished uh, basically the high school level, but she wants to apply for the total doctorate. And so uh, he starts testing her to see how much she knows, and he finds out she knows she's an amazing ability at multiplication and addition. You know, he just starts whizzing out numbers, and she can multiply off the top of her head. And he discovers that all she's done is memorize all the multiplication tables that are possible. So then he starts to test her on subtraction. She can't subtract. She can't divide. And so they, they go through this miserable thing. She just cannot do that, 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 that activity. That play is also a wonderful companion for mammoths play Oleana um, for, for a variety of reasons. But, um, uh, uh, you know, what I found, and we've mentioned, you know, uh, meeting up with people who suddenly the, 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 the cash register, the, the computer at McDonald's or something like that doesn't work, and they can't do the math. Uh, I read an interesting study that indicated that it's not necessary that those students, those people working at that register cannot do the math, but we have to understand the context of which they're trying to perform. And it's fast food, they need to do something very quick, and I've often found that if you, if you calmly say to them, well, let's work out this problem together, get out a sheet of paper and do it, they can do it. You know, they can do the math, but it's a matter of, I've got a whole line of customers, I need to get you your change back very fast, and so what we're really talking about is the process of being able to do that rapidly rather than being able to do it at all. Uh, but I think it really comes back to uh, trying to teach problem-solving skills uh, in the classroom and hoping that our students come out with, with, with that ability to, to solve a problem. Okay. We'll go back to the audience one last time. 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say before we get lost in, in, in too much sentimentalism about yesteryear and, and, and days of old, um, <laughs> I was I was uh, you know running across a, a medieval print of of a, a, a university course, and I saw that there was that there was a, a professor at a podium and students, one of one or two of whom have fallen asleep, that were you know the rest of them were trying to take notes. And it occurred to me that the only thing that had really changed was their outfits. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I wonder if, if uh, when, they, when they graduated, if they weren't saying, well, they're great at Latin, but they don't have any real skills. <laughs> you know, if, and and, and uh, uh, what occurs to me that, that the missing piece in a lot of this is not which facts we should teach. I mean, you know, we're no longer teaching me how to pluck chickens or slaughter them, and if the grocery store is broken, then I'll have to find a new one. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, 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 where's the problem solving? You know, what, what, skills, what skills that you are teaching, how do you use them? Are they a bunch of facts? Are they, are they a single process like long division? Or, or are they, you know, a series of problems like, like life is? Uh, you know where 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 are the problems, and if you want to tie in you know team teamwork and, and group collaboration, where are the, the group collaborative problems, and how do you solve the, the problem with the group dynamics in there that everyone's pulling their own way? Um, let's play. We're going to play the last video, and then I'm going to ask each panelist to kind of give a, a one minute summary um, as to their thoughts as today, and then we'll uh, wrap up and. Classrooms are one of the last places in our society where you can have a sustained conversation about something. We have to protect that. You see schools where they say, look, kids are different. They come in today different. We have to play with them, otherwise we lose them. Meet That's, them on their own terms. We have to meet them on their own terms. We, they won't be interested in the school unless we give them all these gadgets. They're so used to it. You see tons of literature to that effect. It's baloney. It's complete hogwash. These kids are becoming different because we as a society are indulging their, their desires for fun toys. And my concern with this digital media is that it's, it's such short attention span stuff that they get bored. That when they reach an obstacle, they go sideways, wrap it up, don't think about what would be the boring elements to it that would make it interesting and basically take shortcuts in the way that they create their material. Schools are one of the few institutions we have in our society that can be a haven from this madness. One of the things I, I, I was sharing with Dan that I just kind of like about this video is just, I, I think there's some very good points in there, but I also like the fact that he talks about short attention spans and how students can't keep stuff together, and yet in a minute he's edited it together six times to get his point across. But. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, let's start at your end of the table. And okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I think, you know, I, I think in that video he hit a very important point, which is a good summary, and that is that, um, you know, we really need to be thinking about you know, those, those processes, as several of you have said, problem-solving techniques. And I think it is extremely irresponsible for us to back away from, you know, those kinds of critical thinking skills. Now, on the other side of that, I think that we also need to look at that and say, you know, it's easy enough to point and say, oh, you high school teachers, oh, you junior high, oh, you elementary teachers, whatever. It's, it's a systemic problem, and it's not going to be solved, you know, by blaming or whatever. We really need to think about these issues in terms of how many folks who are out there teaching now understand how a search engine works. How many of them are ready to, you know, to, to really integrate critical thinking skills into their classes. They might be great problem solvers, but do they know how to teach someone else how to be a good problem solver? And I think, you know, it, it's not a technology issue. It's a thinking issue. David? Well, in keeping with our air of incivility, I'd like to impose a stereotype on this gentleman. <laughs> uh, I, I envision him as the professor who comes up, drops his stone tablets on the podium, dusts them off, and delivers to a group of students in a room this size the same lecture that he's delivered every semester for the last 15 years. When I teach on ground, and, I, and I'm an adjunct for the School for Education at Park, 
I teach education students and I teach them what is blasphemy. I tell them, in my mind, entertainment is the same as engagement. They actually have very similar functions in your students' brains. So if I'm going to engage my students, I feel that part of my role is to entertain them a bit in order to engage them. Uh, so I'm willing to meet them on their ground. Um, I don't necessarily feel the need to drag them kicking and screaming back to the Socratic method. I agree with what uh, David had just said. I, I keep thinking about uh, some, of the, some of the things that Chaucer used to write about education or what was good education, uh, which involved uh, the combination of teaching and entertainment. Uh, that the two of those go together to keep uh, people engaged in learning. And I've, I've often think about what uh, a professor I had at the University of Akron, Dr. Popplestone, in my abnormal psychology class said, is that learning comes best out of the classroom. Um, and he, he'd often emphasize that the classroom itself can only set up kind of a framework for a series of ideas, but it's what you apply outside, it's what you transfer beyond uh, the classroom that I think is very important. And so I think the sense of transfer, uh, of, of learning, transfer of information, and problem-solving skills are very important. And that often connects with a, uh, a lesson that I give my students, which is a day of uh, the, the, the algebra of communication. Uh, which I'd be happy to share with some of you if you're interested in it, where I talk about you know abstract terms as being variables and how language itself is, a, is, a, is, is, uh, is very much connected to math. Math is a language and they all communicate in one form or another and I sometimes invite math instructors to come in and talk about communication and math and language. So again, transference I think is very important. Thank you. Um, I do think that we need to concentrate on continuing to teach process and uh, critical thinking, but I also think that as instructors we need to set standards high and let students know that you expect them to meet those high standards. Don't accept text messaging type writing on papers and discussion posts, but allow your students to do uh, spend time in reflection and allow your kids to daydream. I'm a big believer in daydreaming. Some of the best problems are solved just by daydreaming or, you know, sitting around outside looking at nature and and that's where the some of the thinking and where we allow our brain to actually start to solve some of those more difficult problems in our lives I think we need to engage our students and our children in thought-provoking conversation and cause ca make them uh, support their answers with what they've either learned in the classroom or thought about on their own free time and we need to be teaching our students if they haven't already been taught about civility about taking care of each other, about etiquette, about how to disagree in a professional manner, and I do that in my online class. They have to uh, disagree by saying I respectfully disagree. Amen. And I think we need to recognize <laughs> that these are just tools. These are, this, these are tools. Let's use the tools, but let's treat people as people. Well, let, me, uh, let me point out a couple of quick things that were said throughout the day. I'll leave the last comment alone. Um, <laughs> but the, the, not here's me. Uh, but um, just just some notes that as we've went through the conversation that you know when we've talked about the when we've talked about these videos and the question before us today we've talked about the decreased uh, ability of critical thinking, uh, control uh, having control and you know are there more distractions now than there ever has been and I think we kind of concluded that we've always had distraction we've always had notes being passed we've always had different things going on um, there. One of the things that technology has allowed us to do, which has been a big benefit, is to teach in different ways. We have different subjects to teach. We, you know, um, and blame shouldn't be put on the technology. Um, and these are just quotes that I had taken from the panel as well. And that one of the things that we struggle with is good models, especially as society advances. Um, but I think we've heard from from the time of the slate or the uh, typewriter uh, to to today that uh, that you know overall we're we're always these, some of these distractions have always been there, and there may be more of them now, and there may not be. Um, but they're new. We may think in a different way. We may do processes in a different way. But from the beginning of time, everybody in this room, everybody that's been in education, is consistently looking at the same thing, and this is why we're here. And that's the continuous improvement and improving the way that we do things, whether it's on the typewriter or whether it's completely in a virtual world. So, um, I want to thank the the panel for stepping up and doing a great job today and speaking. And I, and I also want to say that this will, this will just show you how tough this discussion has been because we actually set it up as 
Susan and David talking about the cons of technology in the classroom, and Dan and Meg talking about the pros of it, and it went back and forth. Um, you know, we had as many cons on one side and pros on the other and going back and forth. So, again, very difficult subject, but appreciate it. Thank you all. I want to do a couple things before we break for lunch. Uh, the one thing that I have up here is that we know that this is a topic that probably many of you would like to continue to be part of. On Friday, uh, Jonathan Bacon will have one of our special interest groups that will continue the conversation. So if you'd like to participate in that. Also, the, the PBS site out there actually has discussion posting. So you can do that at any time. You can look at what other your colleagues, not just here in colleague to colleague, but across the world are talking about. It's actually a, an hour and 30 minute video. Uh, and we just took small snippets out of it to, to talk about. So there's lots more controversy out there uh, if you want to talk about it. Okay. Um, one of the last things I wanted to do before you get out of here is that, you know, Dennis, you started to talk about, you know, two individuals here that, that have given a lot of their time. And I did, I wanted to do this now before the, the closing session. Is that, uh, Larry and Jonathan? I had the thoughts of getting some plaques to put up on your walls, <laughs> but I decided maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. But here is something that Jonathan has always felt very strongly about, uh, is a great big cookie, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say thank you to both of you. And I'll let you two decide if you want to share this or not. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but here you gentlemen go. Thank you for all your years of service. I know there's other people here. I'm starting to see lots of retirements, and that uh, is good for you guys, but maybe the rest of us, we're trying to figure out where we're going to pick up the pieces. But thank you very much for all your service. Um, we will break for lunch now. If you want to follow Larry and Jonathan around, you're welcome to do that. Uh, our next session begins at 1245. And go downstairs, help yourself to lunch, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Good job. Pleasure. Good job.